record before. So we've got a small group here. So uh, I, I'm will be quite informal in this. While we've got some slides here, um, and Randy can drop the 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 links for where the report has been posted. Um, in both French and English uh, in, in the chat, so you guys can grab it there. Um, but because of, the, I guess, the size of the group, we'll try to make this as much of a conversation as we can. So um, Randy prompt me to put in some, you know, to, to do some questions here, given our numbers. And uh, for the, the audience members, if there's stuff that you see that comes up there that you want to ask about or that you'd like to comment on, by all means, interrupt us. Um, so uh, we've got about, how long do we have, Randy? You're muted. 40, 45, go to the top of the hour. Okay, so yeah, so we've got about 41 minutes or so left. So, uh, and as you can see, we don't have a lot of slides considering the first one is the title, the last one is the uh, links, and the second one is just a picture of reports. So really we've actually only got about 12 things to, 12 slides here to go through. And, and as you'll see, uh, the, they should hopefully generate some conversation. So um, this particular report, it's the one here in purple. It's the, it's, what is it? Seventh now? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, the seventh one that we've done uh, in this series since we first got started back looking at the, the pandemic ones. Um, and it's the first one that we've done that's been bilingual, which is actually one of the um, things and hopefully um, we're hoping that things are going to start to return to normal and that this will be the last one uh, along these uh, lines that we've done although uh, while not part of the pandemic series uh, I, I think it might be interesting to do one around this time next year to see how the experience of remote learning and what schools and teachers have been doing over the past two and a half years actually impacted folks classroom practices this year. So not more looking at sort of the blended learning aspects of it and sort of how uh, it's enacted teacher change. But just to go through them a, a little bit, um, the gray one, which was published actually out of sequence, was um, not a canny learn one. It was actually a state of the nation one. And it sort of looked at uh, providing a more academic structure for and a framework for looking at how we did uh, in the pandemic. Uh, the green one was published in the summer of 2020 and essentially looked at what happened in the spring when everything sort of had to shut down immediately. Uh, the orange one was published, I think it was in November of 2020. And it looked at um, how provinces were getting, well, provinces and territories were getting ready for the beginning of the 2020-21 school year. Um, because at the time we were still optimistic and thinking that this, you know, might not last that much longer. The red report was produced around Christmas of 2020, and it was uh, basically a collection of narratives from different stakeholders as to, you know, how things had been going from their perspective. So we had everything from students to parents to teachers to educational leaders to district leaders um, throughout the or, fairly representative across the country. I think we were a little heavy in Quebec, which um, was actually probably, I, I think, a good thing because they um, didn't get as much play in some of the other reports because they were all uh, primarily in English. Um, but as we know, that optimism uh, probably wasn't well placed back in Christmas of 2020 because uh, while the yellow report was published in, in August of 2021, which looked at how the 2020-21 school year went. Uh, the blue report, which at the time when we wrote it, we actually said it was going to be the last one, wrote in the report it was gonna be the last one, um, looking at how the provinces and territories got ready for the 2021-22 school year, because we thought, well, surely it must be over by now. Um, but you know, the, the, the stupidity of humanity and, and other things, um, meant that, you know, we have the purple report now, which reports on uh, both summarizes what happened during the 21-22 school year, as well as tries to summarize what we learned on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis on all of the other ones in that, that sequence. So that'll give you a sense as to, you know, where they all fall and uh, sort of how we envisioned them uh, as we were going through. And, and, and God willing, this will be the last one although Randy and I have said that before. 
um hopefully this time is done and like i said this is the one the the first one that we've we've had in french and and i see trace is uh, in the uh the audience here uh, she was kind enough to uh, write a forward for us uh, for the report so uh, since she is here i will thank her publicly for that um, and folks can give her some kudos in the chat um so as we've been looking at this um, two and a half year journey essentially what we've tried to do is we've tried to and this comes out of that that first gray report but it's the framework that we've been using along the way to figure out um how really how to place these things so if you're looking at sort of what should be happening and where you might be able to um you know place your own schools and school districts or school boards on this chart uh, phase one really was what happened in the spring of 2020 uh, that was you know the the time when um there was a major disruption in the system and you can use this not just for the pandemic but for any sort of disruption that happens and it can be done right at the school level uh, so i'm thinking you know like just prior to the pandemic uh, you know newfoundland closed down for two weeks because uh, well we got six feet of snow dropped on us in 48 hours uh and uh, just couldn't deal with it you know we've got uh, places across British Columbia and, and Alberta that are, are, are on fire on a regular basis and having to shut down school systems. Um, you know, so this can be used in sort of any of those emergency contexts. But uh, phase one is basically what happens in the immediate uh, moment. So uh, essentially just the um, that sort of oh crap moment. What do I do now? Let me grab to the lowest hanging fruit of what I can do to provide some aspect of normalcy for the students and some measure of curriculum continuity. Um, phase two is okay. We've been doing that for a little bit now, and I've had a chance to you know catch my breath. Let's try to you know figure out what other kinds of things that I can add in that's going to address a, a wider range of student needs, address some of the needs of students that really haven't been served during this you know, original emergency sort of period. Uh, phase three, and, and this is where the, the rubber really hits the road and an and, and area where um, I'll be perfectly honest with you, while individuals that I've, uh, I've chatted with across you know, really worldwide, um, often talk about how well their district did this or how well their school did this. As someone you know from the outside looking at it, I can honestly say that I've seen few, if any, um, districts that have or boards that have done this and done this well. Uh, phase three, which often people refer to as a toggle term or toggle semester or toggle year, but essentially it's the ability to switch back and forth between online and face-to-face and not lose any quality or quantity of instruction. So, you know, we're on a Friday afternoon here. If you could imagine around noon today, you get an announcement over the PA that says you're going online on Monday. So don't bother to come into the school, you students and teachers. If your system is at a point where that wouldn't be a problem, that every, come Monday morning, everyone would just log in and do what they would normally do, and there wouldn't be any loss of time or loss of instruction, that's a toggle semester. And like I say, I don't think there's anybody that's really done that well. And then really this, this phase four, and, and in all honesty, I think I'm hoping that this is what our next report is about. Essentially, this is what happens after the emergency has passed. You know, Once we get back to that point where, you know schooling has gone relatively back to normal whatever normal is at that stage what impact did phases one through three have upon the system that continues onward um, you know is there a higher level of online learning that's happening because there's a greater awareness of it is there a lower level of online learning that's happening because people had really negative experiences around the remote learning that happened throughout the pandemic and they you know it's got that stigma attached to it what impact does the fact that teachers were using synchronous and particularly asynchronous tools throughout the pandemic have upon their classroom teaching going forward you know do we see a much higher level of adoption of using learning management systems to provide support materials for face-to-face -face teaching than what we saw pre-pandemic. 
you know, these are all the types of things that, that, that we don't know what's going to happen in terms of, of, of the new normal, but I think they're, they're interesting questions. And that's really what that phase four is focused upon, what, you know, answering essentially all, all of those particular types of things. So um, moving our way through, you, you've heard me use a couple of terms along the way, and, and I've used them very specifically. So I, I've purposefully differentiated between online learning and remote learning. So um, this actually comes from um, a, an article from Educause Review that is cited in, I think, just about every single one of our reports. And uh, if I get a chance, I'll try to drop the link for that one in the chat. Uh, it was written by Chuck Hodges and a group of his colleagues, uh, really, I think about two or three months after the pandemic began. And they wrote an article that uh, the term they used was online learning and emergency remote teaching. Um, and they differentiated the two. And, and this is how they described online learning. I've, I've placed in blue what I think are some of the, the key terms here. But one of the, the main things that you'd get from this, and is the fact that when you look at those particular terms, you can see that this is a planned effort. You know, this is something that we gave serious thought to, that we planned for it, that we got people ready for it, and then we implemented an online learning program. And this is, you know, for the folks in the audience, and um, I, I know most of you have actually, looking at the names here, been involved in these online programs prior to the pandemic. This is how your program was set up. You know, that, that model that Todd was talking about earlier about, um, you know, the way in which the OELC had developed, uh, you know, what, um, uh, his name escapes me, Paul, was it? Randy, Paul? Sorry, <laughs> he's doing a tag team. Sorry, with the- The BC guy, Paul. Oh, Paul Hembley, yes. Yeah, so what Paul was talking about in terms of, you know, both how COOL originally developed, but also how they structured and put in that proposal to become a, a provincial online learning school, you know, that is that kind of planning that goes into to online learning. Um, contrast that with emergency remote learning or emergency remote teaching. And again, this is the definition that, that Hodges and, and his colleagues have used. And if you, again, you look at the words that I've put in blue in particular, you will see the, the contrast from what we, what we view as online learning. And, and those of us in the field, really, I mean, when you look at a program that was set up in sort of this environment and compare it to Paul's Cool or Todd's OELC, you know, it, even just from the basis of, of these descriptions, it's an unfair comparison. But when you look at the, the media and too many, and so many policymakers, unfortunately, and politicians, um, they use these terms synonymously and interchangeably as if they're the exact same thing. And, and as you can see by, you know, the, the nature of, of uh, the fact that, you know, emergency remote learning, for that matter, remote learning in general, because sort of the emergency remote learning is what happened in March and April and May of 2020. Remote learning would have been what happened at the beginning of the 2020-21 school year and has continued really for a lot of the last two years. Uh, but that idea that it's not meant to be a permanent solution, and for that matter, it's not something that we necessarily plan in a way that we know it's going to happen. We plan to a level where it might happen. You know, I, I live in California right now. I have some level of emer you know, emergency planning put in place in case there's an earthquake. Um, you know, particularly in my office, I've got, you know, two gallon, two of those big two gallon water things in my office because we're on an island. So um, chances are the water is going out. Um, I have a plan to jump out the window because I'm on the first floor and I'm in a concrete building that was built, you know, 1920. So chances are the second floor is coming down on top of me and it's all uh, mason, so masonry. So it's not like getting under my desk is actually going to save me in that instance. So I'm going through the window, uh, regardless if it's open or not, uh, you know, but that's the level of planning that I've put in place. 
it's not the same level of planning that I'm going to enact every single day, day in and day out, like the way I normally walk into the office. And that's really the difference between that online learning and the emergency remote learning that we've had. Um, so this is what we had in the spring, and that is perfectly acceptable um, to some extent. And, and we can get into a conversation later about whether or not we should have been better prepared. But the reality was we weren't prepared for this kind of global pandemic, this uh, for not just entire districts, but entire provinces and really the entire world to shut down at a given time. And because we weren't prepared for the most part, this was perfectly acceptable for the spring of 2020. Um, in an ideal world, we would have, you know, we had many of the provinces gave up early in terms of their school year. Um, and most of the provinces in the 2019-2020 school year uh, got rid of their provincial assessments. So what you needed to do to finish out the year wasn't as high. Many of them were, had it set up so that whatever the student was earning at the time of the pan shutdown, um, that's what they would get unless they were able to increase their grade through remote learning. So again, grades and grading didn't become as big an issue. So there was time both at the end of the school year, as well as the ability for us to, you know, delay the start of the, the fall of 2020, or maybe find some funding to bring teachers back earlier, keep them a little bit later to get them prepared for what might happen in the fall. Because at the time we were fairly confident that you know we were still going to have disruptions in the fall we didn't know how much and what they would look like and where we'd be with a vaccine and all those other things but we knew that the 2020-21 school year was going to have some disruptions now what actually ends up happening during the 2021 school year is um, some version of these sort of five things that you've got up here on the the, the screen or you could say three things if, if you look at the edges um, most jurisdictions had planned that we're going to go back in person and, and they felt that they had enough public health safety guidelines in place that they could mitigate most things. So they planned really for in-person learning. Most jurisdictions still had some form of formal distance or online programs that had existed before the pandemic. Um, you know, so you think about those 50 public school districts in, in BC and the, uh, at the time, I think it was 12 private ones. You think about the, you know, all of the consort the programs that are part of the OEL consortium. You think about the, the Learn Quebec program in that province, uh, the CDLI in my home province of Newfoundland. Uh, you know, those were the, the, the planned online learning. And then at least at the provincial level, most provinces had some, comment about or some level of planning and I say some because um, the levels really depended quite uh, wildly um, that if things did need to shut down here's the remote learning aspect that would happen in some cases at the provincial level it was literally a sentence districts should plan for remote learning in the case that schools close uh, other ministries of education had quite extensive plans um, you know, and when you look at what those plans looked like, um, they had some variation. Uh, some were ones where we saw, um, uh, well, Ontario was probably the, the best example of this or the worst example of this, depending on what you think of it. Um, what the, the literature refers to as concurrent teaching. Uh, unfortunately, just to confuse things even more, Ontario actually usually referred to it as hybrid learning. But it's an instance where you had so many students in the classroom uh, with the teacher and the teacher was being broadcast at the same time and so many students from that same class were at home uh, watching it uh, the same way you guys are watching me today. Um, there were true instances of, of hybrid learning where you had schools that were set up in such a way where um, some kids went to school on Mondays and Wednesdays, others went on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the three days that they weren't in school, they were just doing online, everyone was doing online learning. Um, some of those instances, they were streamed and some of it, the folks who were online were just doing asynchronous work. Uh, in most cases, they were set up 
in really, really poor environments. Um, if I remembered that we had 45 minutes, I would have brought up a included another slide here that looked at sort of how much time that takes. But if you can just think about um, and, and just, you know, sort of draw a table in your mind or, or on a sheet of paper in front of you. If on Monday and Tuesday, you've got one teacher that has to plan a set of face-to-face -face lessons and online lessons, and then they have to, sorry, on Monday, and then they have to do the same thing on Tuesday, the same thing on Wednesday, the same thing on Thursday, and then on Friday, they just do online. That's nine sets of lessons that they have to plan for in the span of five days. And unfortunately, what most schools and districts did was they required individual teachers to do that, as opposed to the fact that, oh, well, we've got three grade nine teachers. Let's make one of them exclusively online and the other two will take care of all of the face to face teaching that needs to happen. And, you know, that way everyone only has one set of lessons they've got to set up every day. So there was a lot of stuff that didn't happen in that respect. Um, but for the most part, this is sort of what rolled out during the school year, and um, it, it rolled out with varying levels of effectiveness, uh, and I would say in most cases, not that effective, and rolled out quite frequently. So if you look at the Ontario Science, uh, uh, the Ontario Science table that was advising them, uh, this is a chart that a lot of us saw through the, the CBC, but uh, these are all the number of weeks from up until March, uh, or sorry, May of 2021. So roughly a year into the pandemic uh, that elementary schools lost in, you know, the first say 13 months of the pandemic. Um, so you've got jurisdictions there. Quebec is the least, and this is looking at province-wide closures. This isn't uh, individual, uh, individual schools. So in some cases you had, um, you know, Quebec is actually a good example because the urban areas were, were closed uh, much more than what the rural areas were closed. Um, BC is another good one where it's only at nine, but you had some school districts that were closed for much longer, but even nine weeks. I mean, that's two months out of a 10 month school year uh, that was lost. In the case of Ontario, 19 weeks, that's like for a little bit better than four months, you know, that's almost half of a school year when you factor in that the 10 months includes things like Christmas and Easter and all these other holidays that are in there. Um, you know, four months in a week or so really represents half of a school year where the entire province was closed. You know, that was at the elementary level. If you look at the secondary level, the numbers are the same. There's some little changes throughout. Usually it's only by a week or so. Uh, like you notice that Quebec uh, at the high school level increases by one uh, in that respect. So they were closed for 10 weeks instead of just nine. Uh, but the same kind of thing as you're looking at, it, you know, you're looking between a quarter and a half of a school year being lost um, or at least being, schools being closed. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, I just want to comment on that is that there's, we look at this as a nice summary, but it's not necessarily 100% accurate because there were different assumptions in how the, the uh, science table went in calculating those weeks. Like, for example, in Ontario, it was a little easier because it was either fully open or then it was shut down for across the province in terms of some of their provincial decisions that they were made. Whereas in British Columbia, schools generally were open. There was no province-wide shutdown, but that calculation of nine weeks was based on polling of different schools that bid uh, indicate when they were on or closed their doors. So it was really a little bit more regional and the same issues were in other provinces as well. However, is a general rule of thumb is that you can see that there were different provinces had different approaches which impacted the education system. And I think it's similarly as well in the states, there was a lot of variety and variation in terms of how different jurisdictions went about managing the, the, the COVID crisis around opening up uh, places for, for where people would be in the same sort of interior building. So I don't know whether and Michael Kenyon has joined us as well. I don't know whether there's any experiences relative to Quebec that you can share about that 10 weeks versus Ontario in terms of their closures. He's probably on the phone right now. So, <laughs> oh, there he is. I, was gonna say, I know well, Michael's I in Montreal too, so he was one of the, you know, because these were measuring province-wide closures, and I know Montreal was hit a little bit harder than some of the rest of the province. Yeah, I, I think what you 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 had in in, in Quebec was really a, a very regional approach to uh, to things. Uh, you're right. Uh, 
the the um, urban areas definitely were hard, much harder hit, whereas other areas, uh, more you moved away from them, uh, they felt that they they was not as much need to uh, to shut down. So it was if it averaged out to ten weeks, it's because. Uh, um, in fact, it, it, in the urban areas, it was much more than that, whereas if you, as I said, went into the uh, upper North Shore, lower North Shore, Gas Bay area, um, uh, Rouen, uh, Miranda, that, that kind of area, you, 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 the school stayed open much longer. So as well, there was a lot of discussion that you were hearing as well through the states about learning loss, et cetera, et cetera. Is there anything that you're seeing in Quebec right now about trying to catch up? Because not necessarily seeing as much you know, for, for my local areas in British Columbia in terms of trying to make up for lost uh, pieces other than some summer school programs. Uh, I think it's a lot of what we've heard is just strictly anecdotal. We haven't heard really much about um, how much loss there was. In fact, what we did, the, the only statistic of note that I could maybe help uh, with here is that uh, last year, last school year in 2021-22, uh, our uh, dropout rate increased by 30%. And that happened uh, even though we had less uh, online, fewer online classes, uh, and we relied more on face-to-face. -face. So um, I'm not sure if there was uh, any correlation that can be drawn from all of this, but uh, um, uh, in terms of actual loss, uh, it's as I said, just anecdotal, and, and typically it, um, you have people com complaining about this and that. But uh, I, I don't think there's any substan anything substantive to it. I, I don't know, John. If you're there, you can comment on Ontario. Let's move on. Oh, there he is. Go ahead, John. Sorry, the computer was the, the <laughs> other side of me. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. In Ontario, of course, we had um, a couple of problems initially, especially um, I think some of the, the air was taken out of everybody's wings when we did the initial changeover, um, as Minister Lessier um, announced that um, basically whatever mark students got um, at, the, um, at the point at which the pandemic began would be the mark at the end. Um, that took a lot of, of confidence really out of what was moving on and what was really developed, the hard work that the teachers put in and the boards put in to making this successful. Um, as we then moved into the second shutdown in September, it was um, evident then that um, the work that had been done did start to pay some uh, real benefits. Um, I know from my own perspective, we were lucky um, in terms of the school I had already had a strong hy hybrid model. Um, and so we actually maintained 92% of all of our students uh, at the initial close down. And our students actually opted to, to build and maintain and carry on and improve their grades. So there were really some, some good, um, some strong benefits that came out of, of the pandemic as a whole. Um, and whilst that initial curb on, on confidence in e-learning was there through some of the things that happened, I think over the following year, uh, the challenge and change actually did support what we were doing online. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just looking at the time and I realized I, I chunked into your time there, Michael. So oh, no, ahead. we're that's fine. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, as we start to shift to the 21-22 school year, you know, this is really where we should have been, where we had the opportunity to be at the 2020-21 school year. If districts and particularly if ministries had wanted to invest the time and the energy to prepare and train teachers and systems to be able to do this. Surely a year and a half into this, we would, you know, learn our lesson and, um, you know, be able to move to that toggle semester I was talking about. And there's actually really a, a, a nice model for this. This comes from Derek Wenmuth out, out of New Zealand. Um, and, and he has this sort of, you know, uh, an idea of how you can create a, a, a learning environment or a, a learning experience that leverages sort of all of the different models and that teachers are basically able to, um, he actually refers to it as a learning ecosystem. 
and that teachers and schools are able to sort of not just look on a sort of topic by topic basis, but on a student by student basis and, and think about the learners that they're working with and say, okay, for this topic, for these learners, I think that, you know, a synchronous remote way is a, a, they would learn it just as well as they would in front of me. So let's create a, an environment where they can do that. Whereas these other students need to be, you know, um, face to face with me in a synchronous fashion. So let's do it that way. So it allows for the, the educational environment to essentially leverage uh, both the face to face as well as the distance synchronous and asynchronous really on a topic by topic student by student basis. Um, you know, so and it, it could be at the subject level. So you've got, um, you know, a couple of students that, you know, are really skilled with math and say science that can do most of that on their own in an asynchronous fashion. But, um, and if they were like me, just, you know, can't, you know, whatever it is. And it's uh, funny now that I'm an academic that writes all the time, but, you know, they're just not a good writer in high school and, and, and struggle with, with the English literature. And uh, that, you know, they really need to be in a face-to-face -face synchronous setting for that kind of environment. Um, so this is really what you would strive for in terms of that ideal model for the toggling. Um, now, while most jurisdictions still approached the 2021 school year saying, okay, we're going to be back in classrooms, some of them still had some um, public health measures, although many of them basically said we're going to go about schooling as normal. Um, many of them moved away from, some even told districts that they weren't allowed to offer remote learning as an alternative, um, so that folks either had to be homeschooled, uh, in the case of, you know, Quebec, or um, had to be uh, enrolling in the full-time programs that existed in the province prior to full-time online learning programs that existed. So essentially, the 2021 school year, or 2021-22 school year, really rolled out much the same way that the 2020-2021 school year rolled out, um, with maybe a little less emphasis on this side of the, the equation than what we had in the previous school year. <laughs> You know, so it, it begs us as we're moving forward to, you know, what does that that phase four look like? Um, you know, and, and how do we get to a point where this kind of thing doesn't happen again? Because I, I, I always use the example of, um, at least when I'm talking with Canadian audiences is, you know, when I look at other jurisdictions around the world, they learned the lessons of the past and weren't caught in such the same way that we were. You know, there are a lot of Asian nations, for example, that were heavily impacted by SARS and or H1N1 that at that point in time invested heavily in teacher preparation in terms of online and blended learning. Uh, you had countries in, in that part of the world that would shut down their systems for, in some cases, a full week to do these e-learning drills. Uh, in much the same way that we do fire drills back home. Um, and it's not like we weren't impacted by this before. You know, in, 20, in the 2003-2004 the school year, the Toronto District School Board had to shut down for two full weeks. You know, Canada's largest school district shut down for two full weeks because of the impact of SARS. And at the time, they just shut down. And the superintendent of the school board at the time basically said, you know, well, the ministry's got this this website that folks can use, which was basically an early version of the OERB that is available now. And that was literally all they did. Um, you know, there was no instruction that was happening. And, you know, that was, well, from today, it was, you know, 18 years ago, um, 19 years ago, I guess, from today. And, uh, you know, why the someone at that point in time didn't sit down and say, you know, like what would have happened if this had impacted more than just our school district, if this had impacted all of the, the GTA or all of the province or all of the country, what would we have done then? How would, you know, how can we plan for that so it won't happen the next time? Um, you know, and, but those conversations didn't happen in, at the end of the 23 or at the end of the 03, 04 school year. And in all honesty, they didn't happen at the end of the 1920 school year, really. Uh, they didn't happen at the end of the 2021 school year. We're now past the end of the 21-22 school year, 
and we're still not at a place where um, you know has Oise or I mean you know uh, Therese you uh, I, I don't know how what programs you're teaching in right now but I mean you're you're at Laval you know or UBC how have they changed their curriculum for the initial teacher certification programs so that the next generation of teachers will be in a position that they can you know in, in engage in that ecosystem that that Derek Wenmuth described you know or what I've called the you know being able to toggle back and forth um, you know so beyond just what the new normal will look like how are we getting prepared for the next time because there will be a next time um, global pandemics historically have happened two or three a century. We are 22 years into this century right now, and this century has seen five global pandemics thus far. Obviously, COVID-19 is the one that has impacted us the most, but there have been five declared global pandemics thus far in this century, and we're a quarter of the way through it. So unless you plan on retiring in the next, say, three to five years, chances are you will be impacted by another global pandemic as part of your career as an educator. Not to end on a doom and gloom note, maybe it's better to end on the four questions I've got on the slide there, but you know, it, it is a worthwhile question. How much, as a system, how much better prepared are we today to be able to enact the the necessary changes we need to make if we had to shut down tomorrow or next week or next month or are we roughly the same place we were a year ago or two years ago so we've got about five minutes or so left here and you've been a quiet group even in the chat we haven't had much. <laughs> oh i can poke them i think michael's put his uh video on so go ahead uh, just want to say, well, I think uh, uh, we haven't moved ahead when it comes to online education and, and looking at alternative learning environments. Uh, if we've learned anything in Quebec, or and I don't want to say learned, it's that I think the um, based on a lot of the the uh, direction the ministry is taking, I think we've actually gone backwards. There's a higher, greater resistance to online than we we saw back in 2019. Um, I just didn't see or feel the resistance that I, that we're living through right now when it comes to online education. So unfortunately, I don't think we learned a lot from it here other than a general sense that uh, it's not going to get a lot of uh, support going forward, at least not for not in the short term anyway. And I hope I'm wrong, but I, I don't think so. Just based on just finished a, a meeting with the ministry on, on that topic. And uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic. So I, I don't think we've learned anything, unfortunately. I support, I support what Michael is just saying, you know, uh, there is a school district uh, just nearby uh, Quebec City and uh, the, the pre-service teachers are being told no more Zoom, uh, students will only get written materials, you know, if they get COVID or if they are at home, so it's like uh, we have lots of equipment, but it's mainly it's in the the closet, you know. There is right. we put together a conference of consensus report, and uh, it was at the heart of it, you know. How could we prepare? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it's like people want to put that aside. And we have the teacher unions also, who are kind of, they are not ready to jump ahead. You know, it's like if there is another one, we'll face it when, whenever it arrives, you know. Uh, well, quite frankly, um, it's not giving the push that it could have provided, you know. Uh... I notice uh, Chris and John, I think, are both in Ontario. And Tim is in BC. I don't remember where Michael is. And I don't think I've met Alexis yet. I don't know if you guys want to, you know, or we're into another new school year now. And I guess... You know, in your jurisdictions, are you seeing the, the same kinds of things that, that Michael and Therese are seeing in, in Quebec, that if something were to happen and you guys would have to shut down next week, would it be, would it be like it was last year, or, or uh, are you guys better prepared for it? 
I think um, certainly from what we've seen, obviously, so in Ontario, um, the requirement for remote learning is still in place. So school boards have to have a, a remote learning option. Every school board had to have that even this year. Um, from that, it is causing a, a, some concern. I think it's fair to say with the unions because they're not quite sure um, and they still have some um, trepidation over what those plans are and how that's going to impact uh, the workforce uh, locally. Um, with regard to e-learning, of course, we've got the mandated e-learning piece that's, that's coming in. So um, within the collective agreement for public boards, at least um, at this point in time, um, C14D uh, requires that any teacher who is going to be teaching e-learning uh, receives professional development uh, by that board, it's mandated. Uh, so there's those positive moves on that side. What that looks like currently um, differs from board to board. You know, in some boards, it's the minimum requirement, just a one day PD session. Uh, in other boards, they've expanded it through to six TD, PD sessions throughout the year uh, with a, a consistent onboarding process. So um, board by board, in terms of uh, the professional development piece and, and preparing staff for the next phase, it looks different. Um, but in terms of remote learning and preparedness for if we were to have to pivot again, um, all the tools are still in place, at least because of that remote learning requirement. Interesting. Well, in, in the last minute we have, I know you and actually uh, Therese both mentioned, you know, the, the role of unions in all of this. And, and it's interesting because one of the things that we've we've seen, particularly in comparison, when you look at the difference between the U.S. and Canada, is that the unions, for the most part, have tended to be more favorably disposed to e-learning um, and online learning in Canada than they have in the U.S., and most of their efforts have focused around um, workload issues, uh, ensuring that folks in the e-learning environment have an equitable workload, not necessarily an equal workload, but an equitable workload to what you'd find in the face-to-face -face environment. And, and the same kind of constraints around, you know, um, the, what, you know, what does the workday look like? Um, and training is the other one that they often focus highly upon. Uh, making sure that recognizing the fact that teacher education programs often don't prepare teachers for this environment, making sure that the, either the ministry or districts provide that additional training for this different type of environment. I and mean, we've seen that in a number of collective agreements and, and um, you know, Tim coming out of the, the, the ministry in BC is uh, going to be well aware of all the work that the BCTF did and, and Larry Keene uh, with his, or Kuhn, sorry, with his um, all the research that they were doing out there and it tended to focus around those types of issues. Um, whereas in the US unions have tended to be summarily against uh, online learning for the most part. So um, that's always an interesting uh, dichotomy that I often see. So we're hit the top of the hour and uh, I think we've got another little break here now before the next set of sessions. Is that correct, Randy? Sorry, I was just posting our slides and links. So, uh, and we'll get the recording up as, as soon as uh, it renders. Uh, but yes, we got a, a little bit of a, a 15 minute break, then we go again for a 45 minute block on the next set of. All right. Well, we uh, thank you all for, for thank being you. here. Thank um, you. If you've got any questions, feel free to follow up with Randy or myself. And uh, we look forward to seeing yeah. you in the rest of the sessions throughout the afternoon. Links, okay. slides, and reports are posted in the, the shared document. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And uh, and uh, nice meeting you, Mr. Uh, uh, and Michael. Uh, you know, I'll tell my uncle I was uh, chatting with you in a, in a workshop there.